Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of Prophetic Research Ministry with a very, very special edition of the Watchman Video Broadcast. This is actually the first of three DVDs that we're going to do concerning Dan Brown's new book, The Lost Symbol. In this video, we're going to show you symbols that you may have seen. We're going to show you symbols that maybe you have never seen. We're not only going to show them to you, we're going to reveal in this video exactly what they mean. A lot of people drive by lodges in their hometowns, Masonic temples. You see them all over the place. Most people never, ever know what's going on inside of there, nor the rituals that are conducted or the things that go on there. We're going to show you not only some of those rituals, but we're also going to show you exactly what they mean. In the course of our study, we'll use several primary sources for our information. Number one, Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma. Albert Pike is known as the grandfather of American Freemasonry and was a 33rd degree Scottish Rite Mason. He is so honored by Freemasons that he is entombed in the Mother Lodge of Freemasonry in Washington, D.C. Albert Pike said in his Morals and Dogma, Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. Truth is not for those who are unworthy or unable to receive it or would pervert it. Another source that we're going to use throughout this video is The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manley Hall. Dan Brown based a lot of his book, The Lost Symbol, upon the teachings of Manley Hall and specifically this book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages. In this book, Manley Hall writes, Symbolism is the language of the mysteries. By symbols, men have ever sought to communicate to each other those thoughts which transcend the limitations of language. He also goes on to say, In a single figure, a symbol may both reveal and conceal. For to the wise, the subject of the symbol is obvious, while to the ignorant, the figure remains inscrutable. Hence, he who seeks to unveil the secret doctrine of antiquity must search for that doctrine, not upon the open pages of books, which might fall into the hands of the unworthy, but in the place where it was originally concealed. He continues to write, Concealed within the emblematic figures, allegories, and rituals of the ancients is a secret doctrine concerning the inner mysteries of life, which doctrine has been preserved in toto among a small band of initiated minds since the beginning of the world. Departing, these illumined philosophers left their formula that others, too, might attain to understanding. But, lest these secret processes fall into uncultured hands and be perverted, the great arcanum was always concealed in symbol or allegory. Those who can today discover its lost keys may open with them a treasure house of philosophic, scientific, and religious truths. Many Masonic authors teach and believe the language of symbolism got its start at the Tower of Babel when God confused the languages of mankind. These men, realizing that they could not converse with each other in a normal fashion, began to use symbols to convey thoughts and later to conceal secret doctrines. Nimrod, the builder of the Tower of Babel and of Babylon, was referred to as, quote, the first and most excellent master. A Masonic text known as the Thistle Manuscript of 1756 says that Nimrod created the Masons and gave them their signs and terms so that they could distinguish themselves from other people. Now, in order to fully understand these Masonic symbols, we're going to divide them up into three themes or three categories. The first category is the evolution of man to godhood. Number two, a coming kingdom on the earth or a new age or a new world order. Number three, the rise and revealing of the Antichrist on planet earth. Now, let's look at this first theme in understanding the symbols or the secret behind the symbols of Freemasonry. As always, we're going to use the Bible as our primary source for understanding. It and it alone has the whole truth 
of God contained in it. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to go all the way back to the beginning. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3 to find the theme of the evolution of man to Godhood. Remember, the serpent was in the Garden of Eden and he was tempting Eve, the first woman. And this is what he said. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Manley Hall refers to this in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, and refers to it as, quote, the mystery of human evolution and speaks of the process as turning, quote, man into the estate of gods. There's an increasingly popular notion out there spreading around right now that's popular among biologists, scientists, futurists, philosophers. It's a term called transhumanism. It is the idea that humanity is going to elevate himself above what he is right now. There are other terms for this, homo nexus, uh, which means the joining of man with a, a sort of a higher level, the evolution of man to a new level. Uh, another term for this, homo evolutus, which basically means, that, and all of this concept revolves around the idea that mankind is about ready to enter his next stage of evolution. And that stage is going to be based upon the ability of man right now, scientifically, to either alter or allow the alteration of his DNA. DNA, the book of life itself. The double helix that is the essence of humanity. A book written by God himself that is to remain unaltered and unaccented by any means. Its structure is that of a spiral ladder, joined together by the rungs of four base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. These base pairs are sequenced to form amino acids. These amino acids coded together in a certain structure form the genes that make up humanity. Our first look at Freemason symbols is the ladder of Freemasonry. The ladder reaching from earth to heaven shows the ascension of man in evolutionary steps or degrees to godhood. Related to the Masonic symbol of the ladder is the Masonic winding staircase. This was adopted from the temple that Solomon built. In 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 8, the Bible says, The door of the middle chamber was in the right side of the house. And they went up with winding stairs into the middle chamber and out of the middle into the third. He uses this symbol to show the path of illumination, man's path to godhood. In Dan Brown's own book, Professor Robert Langdon is quoted as saying, The secret hides within is the core tenet of the mysteries urging mankind to seek God, not in the heavens, but rather within himself. In the human body, the DNA is stored in packages called chromosomes. Now, there are 23 of these chromosome pairs, or 46, inside each and every cell that you have. These chromosomes often take on the form of a cross or an X, and they're referred to as X chromosomes. It is interesting to note that in the opening chapter of Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma is the rule and gavel of Freemasonry brought together to form the cross, which now we know is a symbol for the X chromosome where our DNA is stored. Manley P. Hall writes in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, the cross is symbolic of the human body. Now, the second theme that we're going to look at in order to understand what all these Freemasonic symbols mean is the theme of a coming kingdom on the earth or a new age or, as a lot of people are talking about, a new world order. There's a lot of things in the Bible that tell us about this, but we're going to focus specifically upon Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel chapter 2, King Nebuchadnezzar had a vision, and he didn't understand the vision. He couldn't even remember what the vision was. It was the prophet Daniel, a man of God, who came to him to reveal to him not only what this vision was, but the interpretation of the vision. Specifically in this case, we're going to concentrate upon the fourth kingdom prophesied by Daniel in the book of Daniel chapter 2. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces 
and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. A lot of Bible scholars over the years have tried to identify who exactly this fourth kingdom is or where it comes from. But let's follow the principles that are given to us in the scripture concerning the number four. In the book of Ephesians, Paul warned us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against four things, a kingdom consisting of principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. This coming forth kingdom that Daniel predicted is a kingdom not of men, but a kingdom of fallen angels led by the ultimate fallen angel himself, Lucifer. Daniel also spoke of this kingdom as a beast in Daniel chapter 7 having ten horns. The apostle John who wrote the book of Revelation also spoke of this beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. These ten horns are said to represent ten kings that will control the population of planet earth during earth's last days. This brings us to the Jewish mystic symbol of the Sephiroth. It is often referred to as the tree of life and many Masonic and Jewish authors refer to it as a symbol for the divine man. The Sephiroth contains ten circles. These represent the ten kings spoken of by Daniel and by the Apostle John. These ten circles are joined together by 22 paths. These paths are representatives of the 22 amino acids that are formed in the DNA of mankind. It is these amino acids that form gene sequences and that determine who we are as a species. The symbolism of the Sephiroth shows the mingling of the ten kings prophesied in the book of Daniel with the seed of man, literally his DNA. It is these ten circles added to the 22 paths, the 10 kings joined together with the 22 amino acids in man's DNA that Manly P. Hall says forms the 32 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The third thing that we're going to look at, probably the most important thing that we're going to look at concerning understanding the nature and the core and the understanding of Freemasonic symbols is the theme of the rise and the revealing of the Antichrist in the last days. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Revelation chapter 17 verse 8 says, The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. In this passage, the Bible is teaching us is that this beast used to exist is dead now because he received a deadly wound upon his head. He's lying in the bottomless pit, the prison, as it were, that God has ordained to be let open in the last days and once again will be revealed to mankind. Only this time he's going to be revealed not as a diabolical figure, but as God himself. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So much of Freemasonic symbolism revolves around the building of the temple of God or the rebuilding of the temple of God. And this all, of course, is based upon the building of Solomon's temple. What exactly, however, is the meaning of the building or the rebuilding of the temple? 
On the outside of the house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. is written, Mason rebuilds its temples in the hearts of men. Those who study the Bible know and understand that the temple or the tabernacle that Moses built in the wilderness is itself a symbol. But this symbol is revealed to us in the scriptures. The symbol of the temple is the human body. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. So now we understand that in Christian symbolism, which is always revealed by the scriptures, and in Masonic symbolism, which is always concealed by the Masons, the term temple is a term that is used to describe the body of mankind. So when Masonry talks about rebuilding the temple, are they really talking about rebuilding Solomon's temple in Jerusalem? Or are they talking about rebuilding the temple of mankind? Now we're going to get our first glimpse into Masonic ritualism. If a person wants to join the Masonic Lodge, uh, he goes through what's called the Blue Lodge, which is the first three levels of Freemasonry. This candidate is taken into the lodge and he sees a play, a ritual play, performed right in front of his very eyes. The play concerns Solomon, King Solomon, the builder of the temple, and the candidate actually becomes a character by the name of Hiram Abiff. Hiram Abiff is known in Freemasonic lore as the builder of the temple. Hiram Abiff also is known as the guardian of the secrets of building the temple. Fearing that the secrets of building this temple would fall into undeserving hands, Hiram hid these secrets in the two bronze pillars that were put into Solomon's temple known as Jachin and Boaz. Shortly after hiding these secrets in Jachin and Boaz, three men known as three ruffians tried to persuade Hiram Abiff to give them the secrets of building this temple. Hiram refused. The three ruffians then murdered Hiram Abiff by giving him a deadly wound upon his head. This is exactly the way the Apostle John describes the Antichrist or the beast who ascends out of the bottomless pit in the last days. Notice Revelation chapter 13 verse 3. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast. This deadly head wound upon the Antichrist is prefigured in types in the Old Testament. In the book of Judges chapter 4, we find a man by the name of Sisera who was captain of the host of Jabin, who was the king of the Canaanites. Now these are the enemies of God's people. And Sisera, upon realizing that the battle against God's people was to be lost, ran and hid himself inside the tent of a woman. And here's what the scriptures say. Judges chapter 4, verse 21. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent and took a an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it into the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. This also is a beautiful picture of the cross of Jesus Christ fastened in a sure place, being thrust into the place of Golgotha, which the Bible refers to as the place of the skull. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, we have a figure by the name of Goliath. And this is interesting because we know that the number of the beast is going to be associated with the number six. And this is interesting because we know the Bible speaks of Goliath as being six cubits tall. He also has a spearhead that weighs 600 shekels of brass. And later on in the scriptures, we find that Goliath, of course, being a giant, giants having six fingers and six toes on each hand and on each foot. So here we have a figure in the Bible who is full of sixes. And notice how this figure, Goliath, is defeated by David, who is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slung it 
and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. This image of Hiram Abiff appears in stone with a head wound in Roslyn Chapel in Scotland. Roslyn Chapel was built by the remnants of the Knights Templar who are the progenitors of Freemasonry in America. Roslyn Chapel was built to resemble Solomon's Temple. It was Roslyn Chapel that was used in Dan Brown's earlier book, The Da Vinci Code. If you remember, The Da Vinci Code was one of the ways Dan Brown was trying to reveal that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene. And in the book, The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown referenced paintings of Mary Magdalene holding a skull. When the three ruffians killed Hiram Abiff, they buried him and acacia sprigs were laid over his body to conceal it. Acacia is a very important Freemasonic symbol. It is a symbol for concealing, but it is also told that it is a symbol of resurrection. Acacia is another word for thorns. In the symbolism of the scripture, thorns are a symbol of the curse of the sinfulness of mankind. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, the Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Picture in the Bible of sin, thorns are a symbol of the Bible of fallen angels and Lucifer himself, and they are also a symbol for the Antichrist. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Also know that Jesus bore the sins of mankind to the cross with him and also on the cross symbolically showed the defeat of all of his enemies. Lucifer himself, the fallen angels, that those principalities, powers, rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in high places, the fourth kingdom that Daniel referred to in Daniel chapter 2, and of course the Antichrist himself. And so it is that on the cross we see the symbol of of the thorns. John chapter 19 verse 2. And the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they put on him a purple robe. The prophet Ezekiel was warned that his message would be going to people who were of a rebellious house. The wickedness that was in Israel at the time prevented them from hearing the words of the prophet. And yet God encouraged the prophet by saying this. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 6. And thou, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with thee. And thou dost dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Now this is going to take us to one of the most interesting places in the scriptures that that I think that a lot of Freemasonic symbolism hinges around. Revelation chapter 9 and the blowing of the seven trumpet judgments upon the earth in the last days. Here's what happens when the fifth trumpet sounds. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Remember, that is where the beast is. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. In this passage, we see a star falling. And I believe that I know who that star is. And I will show that to you later on in this video. But a star falls and to him is given the key of the bottomless pit. Remember, a lot of Freemasonic symbolism deals with the rise and the revealing of the Antichrist or the ascension of the Antichrist from the place that he is right now. 
The key is given to him. He opens the bottomless pit and a horde of demons that have been held in prison uh, since time began are now being released upon planet earth and their appearance is as the appearance of scorpions. Now listen to the interesting warning given to the prophet Hosea concerning the last days. Hosea chapter 9 verse 6, For lo, they are gone because of destruction. Egypt shall gather them up. Memphis shall bury them. The pleasant places for their silver, nettles shall possess them. Thorns shall be in their tabernacles. So understand the symbolism so far. Here we have the idea that thorns represent this fourth kingdom that Daniel spoke of in Daniel chapter 2. Principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. We also understand from Daniel that this kingdom shall actually mingle themselves with the seed of men. We also see that the tabernacle or temple is a picture of the human body and Hosea is warning that in the last days thorns shall be in their tabernacles. Concerning this, Paul wrote in the book of Hebrews a final warning to mankind. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. In 1976, a movie was released that took the world by storm. The name of the movie, The Omen. The subject of the movie was about the birth and the revealing of the Antichrist. And in this case, the Antichrist is portrayed as a five-year-old boy. The name of this boy, Damien Thorne. Now, what we've seen so far is that the ritual of the murder of Hiram Abiff is actually a concealing or actually a revealing of the death or the deadly head wound received by the beast, according to Revelation chapter 13. But the ritual doesn't end there. The, the key player in this, Hiram Abiff, is resurrected or brought back to life by means of what Masons refer to as the lion's grip also known as the hand of the mysteries. And very simply, this lion's grip or hand of the mysteries is a symbol for the number five. The idea that Hiram Abiff being a symbol for the Antichrist who is raised back to life in the last days is found in Revelation chapter 17. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Hiram Abiff was raised back from the dead by means of what Masons refer to as the lion's paw or the lion's grip. The lion is a symbol in the scriptures for the beast and the devil. Ezekiel chapter 32, a prophecy concerning the Antichrist in the last days. Son of man, take up a lamentation for Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say unto him, Thou art like a young lion of the nations. In his preparation to go to war against Goliath, David referred to Goliath in this way. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing that he hath defied the armies of the living God. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tells us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, as we said earlier, the lion's grip is a symbol that is related to another symbol called the hand of the mysteries. This hand of the mysteries is a key symbol in Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. The villain of the book, a man who refers to himself as Moloch, who is the, the ancient god of the Assyrians, takes a severed hand whom he has removed from a character by the name of Peter Solomon, who happens to be the Grand Master of the House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C., and places it, tattoos these symbols on this hand, and places it under the Capitol Dome in Washington, D.C., Tattooed on this hand are five symbols, a key, a lantern, the sun, a star, and a crown. Let's look at these symbols up close and discover their true meaning. Number one, the key. This key is the one given to the angel that fell in Revelation chapter 9 when the fifth trumpet sounds and is the one that opens up the bottomless pit or the key to the mysteries themselves. 
The lantern refers to the lost word of Freemasonry, which is intended to be a light to the world. The sun. In all the Freemasonic writing, the sun is always a symbol of Osiris, the Egyptian god who was murdered and was brought back to life. The star, of course, is a symbol of Lucifer, son of the morning, the falling star in Revelation chapter 9, who has the key and reveals the Antichrist. The crown refers to the crown of authority that's given to the Antichrist by the dragon in Revelation chapter 13 to rule over the entire earth in the last days. Concerning this hand of the mysteries, Manly P. Hall writes in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, besides its alchemical and Kabbalistic meanings, the figure symbolizes the hand of a master mason with which he raises the martyred builder of the divine house. Philosophically, the key represents the mysteries themselves, without whose aid man cannot unlock the numerous chambers of his own being. In the book, The Lost Symbol, Dan Brown refers to this hand of the mysteries by saying this, The hand of the mysteries is a formal invitation to pass through a mystical gateway and acquire ancient secret knowledge, powerful wisdom known as the ancient mysteries or the lost wisdom of all the ages. Revelation chapter 9 verse 1, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9 11, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. In nearly every instance, the hand of the mysteries is always shown with three fingers up and two fingers down. This reveals an important Masonic theme known as, as above, so below. Actually, this refers to the fusion together into one body of two worlds. The heavenly realm fused together in one body with humanity. And again, this is exactly what we see in Daniel chapter 2, where the fourth kingdom mingles themselves with the seed of men into one body. It is also known as the fusion of opposites. In Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, we see a figure standing next to Jesus, holding his hand outward with two fingers pointing upward and three fingers pointing downward, showing as above, so below. We also see the fusion of opposites in Leonardo da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper in that Jesus is sitting next to not the disciple John, as some people think, but as what Dan Brown revealed in the Da Vinci Code, his wife, Mary Magdalene. The fusion of opposites together, male and female. The divine, as it were, in the form of Jesus and the human in the form of Mary Magdalene. One of Leonardo da Vinci's signature works that was brought out in The Da Vinci Code, also written by Dan Brown, was a painting called Madonna of the Rocks. In this painting, we see baby Jesus bowing and giving obeisance to a baby, John the Baptist, who was giving him the as above, so below sign. Later on, Leonardo da Vinci painted a portrait of John the Baptist giving that famous as above, so below sign. This portrait of John the Baptist was based upon an earlier sketch found in Leonardo's sketchbooks featuring an androgynous human being containing male parts and female parts that Leonardo da Vinci referred to as angel in the flesh. The meaning of this sketch is obvious. The fusion of the angelic realm into the human realm to make humans divine. Also a fulfillment of Daniel chapter 2. The artist Raphael used da Vinci's likeness when he painted Greek philosopher Plato. He is depicted making the as above, so below sign. This concept of the fusion of opposites together or as above, so below is also seen in the Knights Templar symbol of Baphomet. Baphomet is seen with hands extended, one pointing up, one pointing down, three fingers on one hand pointing upward, two fingers pointing downward, and just the opposite on the other side. We also see in Baphomet what's called the androgyny, the fusion of male and female together in one body. And of course, we can also see the symbol 
for DNA. Famed 19th century occultist Eliphas Levi in his book, The Doctrines of Transcendental Magic, shows a picture of the hand of the mysteries, three fingers pointing upward, two downward, showing the fusion of opposites. But notice the shadow that is created by this hand gesture, who some say is the image of Lucifer. Now let's look at the symbolism of the place where Masons meet, known as the Lodge. Freemason Lodges can be seen in most towns and cities across the United States of America. But most people don't know, number one, what they symbolize, and number two, the inner workings of what goes on inside of the Lodge. It's these things that we're going to concentrate on in this segment, and I'm going to show you some very interesting things about the secrets of Freemasonry concerning the Lodge. Freemasonic author Albert Pike wrote in Morals and Dogma, Every Lodge is a Temple. So already we can see that the Lodge represents the human body. Prentice Tucker, a Masonic author, wrote in his book, The Lost Key, The Lodge itself symbolizes the inner man. So the Lodge is going to symbolize the workings of the secret of Freemasonry in the inner man. When a person joins the Freemason Lodge, he is referred to as the candidate and is said to be searching for light. This is a symbolic word for Lucifer. Albert Pike wrote in Morals and Dogma, Lucifer, the light bearer, strange and mysterious name to give to the spirit of darkness. Lucifer, the son of the morning, it is he who bears the light. The Apostle Paul reveals in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. When the candidate himself is ready to join the Blue Lodge and go through the first three degrees, he is blindfolded, symbolic of the fact that he does not know yet who his worshipful master is. Hung about the neck of the candidate, is a noose referred to as the cable toe. Masonic authors agree that it is always to be a cord of three strands. This cable toe is said to symbolize the death and the resurrection of the candidate and is a symbol for the transformation of the Freemasonic candidate. We find then that this symbol is a symbolic representation of the prophecy given to us in Daniel chapter 2. The fourth kingdom literally shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, the seed of men being man's DNA. As we said earlier, DNA is known as the book of life. And this is interesting because we find that very description mentioned in the book of Psalms, chapter 139, written by David nearly 3,000 years ago. David said, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. David, by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, was describing DNA perfectly. He was describing it as a book, and since it is a book, who wrote the book? We all know that God is the author of the book of life itself. And I want you to get this picture, because DNA is a picture of the Word of God. Here we have two strands of DNA, one on one side, one on the other. Those two strands represent the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Scriptures. DNA is joined together. These two strands are joined together, as we mentioned earlier, by four base pairs, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thiamine. And it's interesting to note that the Bible, the Old Testament and New Testament, is joined together by four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, seeing that DNA is a book of life, a book written by God, and is a perfect representation of the Word of God itself, the Holy Bible, there are rules that come into play here. God said to all mankind, you shall neither add to nor take away from the Word that I have given you. Literally, in this case, God is, in, is uh, giving a commandment that says no one can mingle themselves with the seed of men. The fourth kingdom mentioned by Daniel in chapter 2 will literally add to the word of God by adding a third strand to man's DNA. This is symbolic of the Mason's lost word, a representation of the Antichrist, being added to the double helix of man's DNA, making a triple helix, a threefold cord, 
a cable toe. A cable toe or a noose around the neck of the candidate also parallels the many descriptions and the prefigurings of the Antichrist in the scriptures. Genesis chapter 40 verse 19, Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee and shall hang thee on a tree and the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. This was in reference to a prophecy given by Joseph to Pharaoh concerning Pharaoh's baker, who, watch this now, was being held in prison. Joseph revealing by God that this baker would be taken out of prison or revealed or released from the pit that he was in, and he was to be hung from a tree. In the book of Joshua, we find one of the enemies of the nation of Israel, the king of Ai. In Joshua chapter 8, verse 29, the Bible says, In the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass down from the tree and cast it at the entering of the gate of the city and raise thereon a great heap of stones that remaineth unto this day. In the book of Joshua chapter 10, you know, this is the story where Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. Joshua and his men encountered the five kings of the Philistines. Upon finding these five kings, Joshua commanded that they took these five kings and cast them into a pit where they were hidden. Then in Joshua chapter 10, verse 22, the Bible says, Then said Joshua, Open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And in verse 26, the Bible says, And afterward Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. We also have another symbol of this in the form of Absalom, who was the son of David. Absalom, if you remember, was trying to steal away the kingdom from his father, David. David being a picture of the shepherd, Jesus Christ. Absalom would then represent the Antichrist. Notice what is said in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And you have to remember something, that in our description of the of the demons that are released at, uh, out of the pit in Revelation chapter 9, one of the descriptions that's given of them is that, that they have long hair like a woman. Notice what the scripture says about Absalom in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And Absalom met the servants of David, and Absalom rode upon a mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the heaven and the earth. And the mule that was under him went away, and a certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold, I saw Absalom hanged in a yoke. Now, let me add to this a very interesting verse out of the book of Colossians chapter 2. Notice what the scripture says. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. This is referring to Jesus Christ. And having spoiled principalities and powers. Remember the fourth kingdom? He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The Bible is telling us that Jesus made a show, a triumphant show of his enemies while he was hanging on the cross. Notice then what the scripture says in the book of Acts chapter 5. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So we see here that even Jesus Christ is portraying this symbol of the Antichrist by triumphing over the Antichrist by himself being a picture or a model of the defeat of the beast in the last days, which leads us to another famous figure in the scriptures that was hanged on a tree. His name was Judas Iscariot. After he had denied Christ and after he had sold him for 30 pieces of silver, the Bible says this concerning Judas. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. The interesting thing about Judas is that he is the only one in the scriptures other than the Antichrist himself who is referred to in John chapter 13 
as the son of perdition. Now, once again, let's get back to the candidate as he is approaching the inner sanctuary of the lodge, which, remember, is a picture of the heart of man or the temple of the human body. Remember that the candidate is searching for light, and he is blindfolded because he doesn't know yet who his worshipful master really is or the identity of the master that he is about to bow to and serve as being a member of the lodge of Freemasonry. His clothing is what's interesting at this point. We see that the Mason, the candidate to Masonry, is being brought in blindfolded, and he has his right sleeve up and his left sleeve rolled down. We see that also that his right leg is rolled up and his left pant leg is rolled down. Oftentimes you will see a Masonic candidate or a Masonic candidate is dressed with his shirt partially open and partially closed. Masons refer to this as being not naked, but not clothed. The key to understanding the Masonic clothing is right in front of your very eyes. We see opposites. One arm bare, one arm covered. One leg bare, one leg covered. We see the chest, the body of the man, partially covered, but partially bare. This is the fusion of of the opposites or the fusion of two kingdoms that are opposite one another one divine one human one from heaven one from earth symbolic of the fusion of male and female together similar to the way that baphomet is represented now before the candidate walks into the actual chamber or the sanctuary of the lodge itself he must do so by getting permission permission is granted to him so long as he gives three and only three knocks upon the door. Why three? Now this number three we're going to see throughout this presentation. It is one of the most sacred numbers in all of Freemasonry. Now I want you to remember, as we've already looked at, part of the secret behind Freemasonry. Remember the cable toe? It is a cord of three strands. We have seen that that cord represents the fusion of the two kingdoms man's two-strand DNA being added to by a third strand, a triple helix of DNA. But let's look back to the source of the number three and its meaning. And we go back to Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter three is the story of the fall of man. The tempter come in deceiving Eve, Eve eating of the fruit that God forbid them to eat from, giving to her husband Adam, and thus all mankind is born into sin. I want you to notice particularly what Genesis chapter 3 reveals concerning this sin. Here is the tempter, Lucifer, the serpent, speaking. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was, here it is, number one, good for food, number two, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and number three, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Notice the pattern of the number three concerning the fruit that was hanging from a tree. The apostle John refers to this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. So we see that the sinfulness of man is always associated with the number three. When the Masonic candidate walks into the sanctuary, the inner chamber of the lodge, he is walking upon what's called the mosaic pavement. It is a tiled floor consisting of black and white tiles. This shows the union of opposites, black and white, male and female, yin and yang, heaven and earth. Now, so far we have seen several examples, and we will continue to see examples throughout this presentation, that masonry involves the fusion of things that are opposite, black and white, male and female, the union of the divine or the heavenly with the earth. And yet God reveals to us in his word that the true nature of Bible Christianity and the true belief of God is not the fusion of things that are opposite, 
but the separation of things that are opposite, including light and darkness. Genesis chapter 1, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Paul reveals this same doctrine in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? Notice the opposites. What communion hath light with darkness? Notice the opposites. What concord or agreement hath Christ with Belial? Belial is a name given to Lucifer. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel. And what agreement, here it is, hath the temple of God with idols. Now remember that in Revelation chapter 13, when the beast rises up out of the sea, having his deadly head wound that is healed, the false prophet rises up out of the earth and he builds an idol or an image to the beast. And all of the world worships the image or the idol of the beast. And the Apostle Paul says, What agreement hath the temple of God, which is the human body, with idols? In other words, he's saying, and he is predicting what is going to happen in the future, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. How is it that the temple of God, the human body built by God himself, how is it that it could be fused with the temple of idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, he says. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jesus himself predicted in the last days, a last days church that was going to be the fusion of things that are opposite. He said of the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, the fusion of cold and hot together, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. So now the candidate has knocked three times upon the doorway. He has entered into the inner sanctuary of the lodge or the very core of what is going on in the lodge, which, remember, is a picture of the temple of the human body. The candidate is then brought to the exact center of the Freemason Lodge where he finds the altar. In the house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C., the ceiling directly over this altar is a large pane of glass. This is so that the candidate can be blessed by Osiris, the sun god, by day, or by the stars, the twelve signs of the zodiac, by night. The altar is symbolic of the death of the candidate. And because it is in the center of the lodge, many Masonic authors agree that it represents being halfway between the human part of the lodge and the divine part of the lodge. So therefore, it represents the point of transformation. To the candidate... This shows the fusion of heaven and earth together, as above, so below. Sitting directly on top of the altar in the Masonic Lodge is usually a King James Bible. Now, in the House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C., you may have seen a lot of clips of this. Uh, There are actually eight what they refer to as sacred texts, which represents the volumes of the sacred writings of the various religions of the earth. One of the things that Freemasonry likes to let everybody believe is that they embrace all religions or no religions at the same time. And yet in that same building, there is a different meeting room where the upper echelon of Freemasons meet, the 33rd degree Masons meet in this special room. And it's said that they conduct various business agreements or business arrangements concerning uh, the lodge and some of the things they do. I've been in this room and there is the altar in the center of this room. And of course, there you have the altar being in the center of the room, representing the fusion point between the human and the, and the divine. And on this altar in particular is one book, and that book is the King James Bible. On top of this Bible, something that you will see in almost every lodge around the world 
is the symbol of the square and compass. Now, we're going to show you what that square and compass means here in just a few minutes. But I want you to remember the symbolism here. Remember, the Bible represents a perfect representation of the DNA of mankind, the seed of man. And now we have something placed on top of it, along with it, because they believe the Bible to be an imperfect book. It needs to have something added to make it right. Here again is the symbol that man right now is in an imperfect state. Once something is added to mankind, he will now be a perfect being, a God. This then brings us to what is the quintessential symbol of all Freemasonry, the square and compass. The images are based upon the tools of a stonemason. Almost every Masonic author agrees that the square and the compass fused together represent the fusion of things that are opposite. Albert Pike reveals in Morals and Dogma that the square represents the earth, the female, the passive. The compass then represents the heavens or the male part or the active principle. And they are fused together. This shows the fusion of the two kingdoms that Daniel spoke about. In Daniel chapter 2, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Notice this emblem from Albert Pike's Morals and Dogma, which is the cover symbol for the 32nd degree, which is called the Sublime Prince of the Royal Secret. Notice we have a figure here, a body. In the right hand, the body is holding the compass. In the left hand, the body is holding the square. And of interesting note is that this body has fused into its body two heads, that of a man and that of a woman, the fusion of things opposite together. That is what the symbol of the square and compass means. If then the compass represents the male and the square represents the female fused together, the symbol of the letter G would then represent their offspring or the result of their fusion together. Many Masonic authorities agree that the letter G represents geometry or several of them say that it represents God. But one of the easiest ways to identify the letter G and the symbolic meaning behind the letter G is to count. The letter G is the seventh letter of the alphabet. And so G represents the number seven. Remember, as we discovered earlier, that the beast, the Antichrist, has seven heads. His father, the dragon, the one who gives him the authority, also has seven heads. This is representative of the opposite of the seven spirits of God, or as the Apostle John referred to, the spirit of Antichrist that is already working in the earth. Masons often use multiple ways of showing or concealing a symbol or a number. Another way of showing the number seven is by use of the triangle and the square. The triangle, of course, having three points, the square having four. Albert Pike says in Morals and Dogma, seven is the sacred number in all theogenies and all symbols because it is composed of three and four. He later goes on to say the symbol of the triangle and the square together is symbolized by a warrior crowned, bearing a triangle on his cuirass, standing on a cube to which are harnessed two sphinxes, one white and the other black, pulling contrary ways and turning the head to look backward. And again, Albert Pike later reveals that the triangle is a symbol of the heavens or the male principle. The cube or the square is a symbol of the earth, the female principle, and they are fused together. This design, that of a triangle on top of a cube or a square, is seen in the design of the House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. This lodge is at the opening and the closing scene of Dan Brown's lost symbol. Let's look a little more closely at the House of the Temple Lodge in D.C. and the design of the building. We see that the bottom part represents a cube, which Albert Pike says represents the earth or the female principle. It has 33 pillars. On top of this is a step pyramid, which Albert Pike says represents the heavens or the male principle. 
It has 13 steps. So we have the earth principle representing man fused together in the same temple with the heavenly principle representing Daniel's fourth kingdom that shall fuse themselves in with the seed of men. And if we were to count, we would find that 33 pillars added to 13 steps gives you the number 46. This is the exact same number of chromosomes in the human cell where the DNA is stored. This is also symbolized in the combination of the Scottish Rites and the York Rites of Freemasonry. In the Scottish Rite, there are 33 degrees. In the York Rite, there are 13 degrees. Added together, you get 46, the number for the temple of man. The design for the Masonic House of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. is being mirrored all over the country. Near our hometown in St. Louis, Missouri, it is the basis for the St. Louis Civil Courts building. You have a Greek Parthenon, a symbol of the cube or the number four, topped by a step pyramid, symbol of the number three or the divine fused together. On top of that, you have two sphinxes. And I'll show you what a sphinx is here in just a little bit. But you have two sphinxes, one pointing in one direction, east, and one pointing in the other direction, west. It represents the fusion of opposites together. Most people walk up and down the streets of St. Louis and never have an idea of what this building represents until now. It's also seen in the Indianapolis War Memorial and in the police headquarters building in Los Angeles, California. You might be able to see a building near your hometown with the same design, and now you know what it means. Another way of depicting the number seven is by way of the lambskin apron. This apron consists of a triangle, which is a representative of the number three, the heavenly, and a square representative of the number four, the earthly. They are fused together in one apron showing the fusion of the two kingdoms. Another symbol that is closely linked with the square and compass of Freemasonry is that of the blade and chalice. Dan Brown referred to this and actually revealed this to the world in his book, The Da Vinci Code. It is seen in Da Vinci's painting of the Last Supper, the image of Christ being the blade or the triangle pointing upward, the space between he and the woman sitting next to him who's supposed to be Mary Magdalene being a symbol of the chalice or the earth principle, and they are fused together, the human being fused with the divine. This fusion of opposites in the blade and the chalice can be seen in what most people call the Star of David, but it was actually referred to as the Seal of Solomon. It represents the key to immortality, or union of the human with the divine. Eliphas Lephi, in his book, The Doctrine of Transcendental Magic, calls it the chariot of Ezekiel, which is a reference to Ezekiel chapter 1 and the four cherubs that Ezekiel saw bearing up the throne of God. These four cherubs in the occult world are symbolic of the fourth kingdom of the book of Daniel chapter 2, where they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Albert Pike says in Morals and Dogma, For the master, the compass of faith is above the square of reason. But both rest upon the Holy Scriptures and combine to form the blazing star of truth. Albert Pike later goes on to reveal that the blazing star actually represents the god Horus, who is the son of Osiris, the sun god. Remember, he is the one that is murdered and brought back to life. And Isis, or in other words, the male principle and the female principle, the heavens fused with earth, the divine fused with human beings and is the same as the all-seeing eye of Freemasonry. The blazing star is also a symbol for the Eastern Star, the Woman's Auxiliary Organization of Freemasonry, and is always seen in the form of a pentagram. Concerning the pentagram, Manly P. Hall writes in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, the pentagram is the figure of the microcosm, the magical formula of man. It is the one rising out of the four, the human soul rising from the bondage of the animal nature. It is the true light, the star of the morning. It marks the location of five mysterious centers of force, the awakening of which is the supreme secret 
of white magic. The pentagram is used extensively in black magic, but when so used, its form always differs in one of three ways. The star may be broken at one point by not permitting the converging lines to touch. It may be inverted by having one point down and two up, or it may be distorted by having the points of varying lengths. When used in black magic, the pentagram is called the sign of the cloven hoof or the footprint of the devil. The star with two points upward is also called the goat of Mendes because the inverted star is the same shape as a goat's head. When the upright star turns and the upper point falls to the bottom, it signifies the fall of the morning star. Now let's look at the true biblical meaning of the symbol of the pentagram. You see that the pentagram represents a particular number. It represents the number five. Let's then go to the scriptures to get understanding. Remember, Manly P. Hall said that it signifies the fall of the morning star. Let's look at what Isaiah chapter 14 reveals about the falling of this star. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? Now God is looking into the heart of Lucifer himself and he sees that Lucifer has a plan. He has an agenda represented by the pentagram, the five-pointed star. And here in Isaiah 14, we see Lucifer's five-point plan. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, I will be like the Most High. Lucifer is saying here that he wants to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. In Revelation chapter 9, again, we see the fifth trumpet sounding. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, unto the earth? And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, 11, And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. This, of course, is the beast that we've been talking about, the revealing and the unsealing of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8, The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, you may have seen the pentagram in a lot of places, but specifically, it is commonly associated with the occult or with the religion of Wicca. Wicca practices what's called the Great Rite Ritual. Let's look at what this ritual is and its association with the five-pointed star or the pentagram. In Wicca, the great rite is either ritual sexual intercourse or else a ritual symbolic representation of sexual intercourse. In the symbolic version, the high priest plunges the athema or ritual knife, the male symbol, into a cup or chalice, the female symbol, which is filled with wine and is held by the high priestess. The great rite symbolizes creation in the union of the maiden goddess with the lover God, and thus is also known as a fertility rite. A variety of ritual occasions call for the great rite to be performed, such as during the festival of Beltane on or about May 1st. Author Kathy Burns reveals that the great rite invocation specially declares that the body of the woman taking part is an altar with her womb and genitive organs as its sacred focus, and it reveres it as such. The high priestess then lays herself down towards the altar and her arms and legs outstretched to form the pentagram. A quote from paganlibrary.com reveals, the high priestess then lays herself down face upwards with her arms and legs outstretched to form the pentagram. The high priest fetches the veil and spreads it over the high priest's body, covering her from breast to knees. He then kneels facing her with his knees between her feet. This is why in the Freemason Lodge, the altar 
is usually in the place of the blazing star, a pentagram. This is also why the candidate kneels before the altar. The meaning, of course, of the great rite ritual reveals the secret of Freemasonry, the union of opposites, male and female together, or the joining of the divine with the human. Manly P. Hall writes in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, the Pythagoreans taught that the elements of earth, fire, air, and water were permeated by a substance called ether, the basis of vitality and life. Therefore, they chose the five-pointed star or pentagram as the symbol of vitality, health, and interpenetration. Another symbol related to the pentagram is the symbol of the skull and bones. The Skull and Bones Society is the secret society located at Yale University. George Herbert Walker Bush, George W. Bush, and John Kerry were all members of the Skull and Bone Society. The skull and bone consist of two leg bones crossed and a skull placed over them. The skull is that of the enemy of God, the Antichrist. The crossbones are a symbol for the chromosomes where the DNA is stored. The meaning of the skull and crossbones is the mingling of the seed of men with the beast, the Antichrist. In towns and cities all across America, Freemasons are often involved in the laying of a cornerstone of a building. This cornerstone ceremony often features a stone suspended by a tripod, a symbol for the number three, and the stone is anointed with three gifts, corn, wine, and oil. Masonic author Prentice Tucker refers to these in his book, The Lost Key, as, quote, the wages of the stonemason. The wages, the corn, wine, and oil are symbolic of the results in spiritual or mental qualities of work done by the spirit in the lower natures. Corn is a symbol of death and resurrection, burying the seed in the ground, a type of the buried lost word of Freemasonry. Hence, it is a symbol for the Antichrist who is buried in the heart of the earth, the abyss, the pit. In time and in season, the germ of the corn will rise up from the ground with new life. This is a reference to the beast who was and is not and yet shall be. Wine is a symbol of either drunkenness or wisdom. New wine, which is a representation of the Holy Spirit of God through the pages of the Bible, is a spirit of wisdom. Old wine, which is poured out by Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, is a symbol of drunkenness. Remember, Babylon holds a golden cup in her hand and it is full of the wine of drunkenness. This cup is also associated with what Dan Brown referred to in the Da Vinci Code as the Holy Grail, the secret of immortality, the secret of men becoming gods. Oil is a symbol of separation and anointing. This itself is a symbol of the entering in of and being led by a spirit. The symbol of corn, wine, and oil together is a veiled reference to the number three. From Genesis 3, remember, we learned of the three parts of sin, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It is also a revelation of the man of sin that is to be revealed, the son of perdition. Since Masonic authors refer to corn, wine, and oil as the symbols of the wages of a stonemason, we reference Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that says, For the wages of sin is death. The symbol of corn, wine, and oil also is a symbol for the triple helix. Wine and oil in many Masonic ceremonies are often carried in silver vessels. The corn, however, which is representative of the Antichrist, is almost always carried in a gold, showing the superiority of the one over the two, hence the superiority of the third strand of DNA over the other two strands of DNA written by God himself. Now, there is a little-known Masonic symbol called the Lewis Key. The Lewis Key was a device used to lift large stones into place used in Masonic cornerstone ceremonies. The Lewis Key consists of two half-triangle pieces of metal inserted into a corresponding notch 
in the top of the stone. The key is the third or center part that binds them together and holds them in place. As with most things in masonry, the secret to the Lewis key is concealed in stone. The Lewis key can be seen on an old Masonic tracing board showing a figure making the as above, so below sign with the Lewis keys for hands. The Lewis key then is a symbol for the number three, showing the two half triangular pieces are insufficient without the third, a representation of the triple helix three-strand DNA. Also referencing the number three, we find as we walk through the lodge, the three lights of Freemasonry. They form a triangle inside the center of the Masonic Lodge, but not any triangle, a right angle triangle or a Pythagorean triangle. Pythagoras was a philosopher and mathematician who lived about 500 years before Christ. Albert Pike says that he was named after a python a serpent. Pythagoras devised what was to be called the Pythagorean Theorem. The Pythagorean Theorem states the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Hence, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. All Masonic writers agree and understand this to be a veiled reference to the great secret. A squared, or the first line of the right angle triangle, represents the male, Osiris, one of the sons of God, or the Iron Kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. B squared, or the second line of the right angle triangle, represents the female, Isis, the daughters of men, referenced in Genesis chapter 6, or the kingdom of clay in Daniel chapter 2. C squared, then, is the result of their fusion together, the Antichrist, or the final evolution of men into gods. Triangles themselves are a very sacred symbol in Freemasonry. It is a representation of the number three, hence a representation of the Antichrist or the man of sin. It is interesting to note that Freemasons also use the symbol of the triangle as a symbol for resurrection. But in this case, it would be the resurrection of the man of sin. It is also representation of the triple helix DNA. Many triangles can be seen in the work and the lodges of Freemasons. The trowel of the Master Mason forms a triangle. The setting mall forms a triangle. The hands of the high priest conferring a threefold blessing form a triangle. This is indicative of Mr. Spock of Star Trek fame. Gene Roddenberry, who created the Star Trek series, was a Freemason. The 24-inch gauge in Freemasonry flips into a triangle, which is a symbol of of the perfect man, the evolution of man into godhood. Other representations of the number three in Freemasonry, the Masonic hailing sign, a Mason holding both hands up. This represents the junior warden, the senior warden, and the worshipful master as the head. This is also a symbol of the left and the right fused or joined together by the head in the middle. This represents the two kingdoms joined together to make man into gods. Oftentimes a Masonic grip will involve a thumb on the third knuckle. Albert Pike says that the Masonic handshake represents the number 10. This is the number for the ten-toed kingdom of Daniel chapter 2 where iron is mixed with miry clay or the fusion of things that are opposite. In this Masonic drawing we see a ritual referred to as 3 times 3 times 3. Three Masons will join themselves together by number one, joining their feet. That represents down below. Their upper hands are joined together. That represents things that are above. And their hands are joined together in the middle. So here you have the fusion of opposites together, as above, so below, joined together in the middle. This also is a representation of the sacred symbol called the Triketra. The Triketra is also a symbol for three-strand DNA. The Triketra is seen in the tarot card of the Hierophant. He holds in his hands, it is said, the keys to human transformation. The numbers 3 times 3 times 3 equal the number 27. This is the occurrence of the book of Daniel in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation in the New Testament. 
The phrase, the Most High, occurring in the pages of the Bible, is a reference to the Lord God above in heaven. The 27th occurrence of the phrase, Most High, in the King James Bible is found in Isaiah chapter 14. I will be like the Most High. In Dan Brown's book, The Lost Symbol, an unfinished pyramid is found in a secret chamber underneath the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. The main character of the book, Robert Langdon, has been previously given possession of the capstone, and it is told that the two must come together in order to solve the mystery and give the villain of the book, Moloch, the key to transformation. We commonly see the unfinished pyramid on the back of the $1 bill. The all-seeing eye is the capstone of the unfinished pyramid. Masons would tell you that the all-seeing eye is the all-seeing eye of providence or of God. But Manly P. Hall refers to this in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, as the Masonic Christ who is the God with one eye. The all-seeing eye capstone is a representation of the illumination of the third eye in the New Age movement and the occult. In the Hindu religion, a person will often place a mark upon their forehead as an emblem of their third eye being opened or their inner light being opened, showing in a symbol that they have been transformed into gods. This was the promise given by Lucifer, the serpent, to Eve in Genesis chapter 3, and that he promised her that her eyes shall be opened and she shall be as gods. The symbolic meaning of the pyramid is that the base of the pyramid has two points. These represent the current two strands of human DNA. It is unfinished in Masonic idealism. It is incomplete. It will be completed by the addition of the Masonic Christ, the Antichrist, the kingdom that shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. When the blindfold is taken off the candidate in the Blue Lodge of Freemasonry, it is revealed to the candidate that he has now knelt before a man who is referred to as the Worshipful Master. This is in direct violation of the scriptures which say, Be not ye called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. Manly P. Hall writes that the worshipful master is a symbol of the sun god Osiris. He says, the sun rises in the east, and in the east is the place for the worshipful master. As the sun is the source of all light and warmth, so should the worshipful master enliven and warm the brethren to their work. One of the abominations that God saw among the elders of Israel found in Ezekiel chapter 8 was the fact that they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worshipped the sun toward the east. It could be said then that the true light of Freemasonry is the worshipful master. It is the worshipful master in the drama of Hiram Abiff with the key of the lion's grip in his hand, who raises Hiram Abiff, which, remember, is a symbol for the Antichrist, back to life. In the symbolism of the Masonic Lodge, you have the junior and senior warden seated to the right and to the left of the worshipful master who sits on a throne. This same symbolism is associated with the Masonic hailing symbol and the capstone topping off the unfinished pyramid. In the house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C., this throne that the worshipful master sits on is exactly 33 feet tall. 33 is a number that is highly sacred to Freemasons. And at the end of this broadcast, we will show you exactly what this number 33 means. One of the most significant and telling symbols in all of Freemasonry are the symbols of the two pillars of the temple, Jachin and Boaz. They are seen in the house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. as two sphinxes. A sphinx is the fusion of a human 
and a lion, revealing the purpose of the fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2, when they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. One sphinx has the ornament of a female. The other has the ornament of the male in the form of a serpent. Often you will see Jacob and Boaz and Masonic emblems topped with a globe. One is a representation of the earth. The other is a representation of the stars. Again, this shows the mingling of the two kingdoms or the two realms in Daniel chapter 2, the earthly realm with the divine or angelic realm. But the most telling aspect of Jacob and Boaz and what they really represent is revealed to us in the pages of the scriptures. Remember that the temple is a picture of the human body. Solomon built in the entrance to his temple two pillars made of brass. First Kings chapter 7 gives us a number associated with those two pillars. For he cast two pillars of brass, 18 cubits high apiece, and a line of 12 cubits did compass either of them about. And he made two chapters of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of the one chapter was five cubits. The height of the other chapter was five cubits. This gives the total height of the two pillars in Solomon's temple as 23 cubits apiece. This is the exact number of chromosome pairs that are found in every cell of the human body where our DNA is stored. Often in Masonic emblems, you will see Jacob and Boaz joined together by an arch, the royal arch of Freemasonry. As in stone masonry, both the strength and the binding together of the arch lies in the keystone. The imagery is that of two opposites, male, female, heaven and earth, the human and the divine held together by the keystone. The keystone is related to the lapis exilum or the hidden stone or the lost stone or the lost word of Freemasonry. This stone or lost word lies buried and is waiting to be revealed in due season. The keystone then is another symbol for the beast who was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It is interesting to note that Pennsylvania is referred to as the Keystone State because it lies in the center of the 13 original colonies. It was there that our nation was first founded. Another form of Jacob and Boaz with the royal arch is seen in the equinoxes. Two days out of the year, March 21st and September 21st, are the two days of the year when there is an equal amount of hours in both day and night, 12 hours in the day, 12 hours in the night. This is, in Masonic imagery, a symbol of the fusion of opposites, day and night, earth and heavens, human and divine. Now here's an interesting fact. The center point or keystone of the equinoxes falls on December the 22nd. This is also known as winter solstice. There was a feast in ancient Rome in the ancient mysteries referred to as the Saturnalia that surrounded the keystone day of December the 22nd. The ancient priests believed that the sun represented their God who was murdered by the three killers or three months of autumn, which also is a symbol of the three ruffians who killed Hiram Abiff. His death occurred on the keystone date, December the 22nd. After three days, he came back to life, seen as the days getting longer, and revived on December the 25th, which is a celebration of the rebirth of the sun god. Is it possible that the Bible was referencing this when it says in Revelation chapter 11, and when they shall have finished their testimony, speaking of the two witnesses, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. 
because the two prophets tormented them that dwell on the earth. Another representation of the equinoxes or the pillars of Jacob and Boaz are seen in the two saints, John, John the Baptist and John the Divine. These two men represent the rough and smooth ashlars of Freemasonry or the rough and smooth stones of Freemasonry. John the Baptist represents the rough ashlar. John, the revelator, represents the smooth ashlar. The symbol of the rough ashlar and the smooth ashlar, or the rough and smooth stone, represents the imperfection of man being brought to perfection by the working tools of Freemasonry. Often in Masonic imagery, you'll see two lines. They represent the saints, John, and they fall on either side of a circle with a dot in it. This is referred to as the point within the circle. Dan Brown refers to it in the lost symbol as the circumpunct. The circle is the symbol for the female. The point is the symbol for the male. This shows again the union of these two opposites to produce godhood. Also associated with the equinoxes or the two pillars of Jacob and Boaz is the equality symbol, usually represented by a pair of balances. These show equality or things that are fused together and balanced and equal. Balance is a core principle in many Asian philosophies and it is the central theme behind the yin-yang. The idea of balance can be seen on the tarot card of justice. Here we have a woman, a goddess, holding a sword in one hand representing the male and a pair of balances in, in her other hand representing the female, the fusion of opposites together. This same symbol can be seen on the exterior of many courthouses all across America. One of the more prominent Masonic symbols is that of the Rose Cross, seen here on a Masonic temple in McAllister, Oklahoma. Albert Pike said the rose and the lotus are yonic emblems, signifying primarily the maternal creative mystery, which basically means that the rose is a symbol for mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. According to Dan Brown's earlier novel, The Da Vinci Code, a common phrase for those involved in mystery religions and secret societies is that of sub rosa, which means under the roses. This symbol, when used, is used to indicate something that's done in secret or something that is concealed or something that is hidden. The symbol of the rose is often used in Roman Catholic cathedrals. Many of these Roman Catholic cathedrals were built by the Knights Templar during the Middle Ages. In the Templar-built Roslyn Chapel in Scotland, we see roses adorning the ceiling. Often these roses come in the form of a five-petaled rose, which is the form of a pentagram. Here again, we have a secret symbol for the number five, which refers us to Isaiah chapter 14 and Lucifer's five-point plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the side to the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. This also brings us to an association with the fifth trumpet in Revelation chapter 9. It was also revealed in Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code that the word Roslyn was a way of saying rose line. Now in the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown explained that the rose line was supposedly the secret bloodline that existed between Jesus Christ and Mary Magdalene. And so the phrasing is simple. The rose line refers to the male principle joining with the female principle or the divine joining with the human and producing the Antichrist in the last days. The rose cross was one of the fundamental symbols of the Rosicrucians, whose influence helped form Freemasonic philosophy. Again, in the secret teachings of all ages, Manley Hall writes that the rose equals the symbol for the female and the cross is the symbol for the male. These items then are fused together to form the God-man. The symbols of the male and the female can also be seen on the porch of the same Masonic temple in McAllister, Oklahoma. Closely related to the symbol of the rose cross is the symbol of the cross and the crown. The cross represents the male. The crown represents the female. They are fused together to form the God-man. This symbol is seen right outside of a church in Missouri. 
This symbol was also used on the tombstone of Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell was the founder of the Jehovah's Witness cult. The Jehovah's Witness idea was based upon the early Gnostics around during the days of Paul. The Gnostics believed that every human being had a divine spark or a spark of divinity located deep inside of them awaiting a ritual or awaiting a certain point in time when that spark would erupt into the full flame of divinity, making the human divine. The five-pointed rose symbol is also seen on the death card of the tarot. Its number is 13, showing its relationship to mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. One of the most interesting aspects about the rose is that the rose conceals the thorn. Hence the thorn mingled with the seed of men in the form of the cross, the X chromosome where the DNA is stored. The emblem of the broken column features a woman weeping over a broken column holding a sprig of acacia. Father Time is pouring ambrosia over the ringlets of her hair. Most all Masonic authors agree as to the nature of the symbolism of the broken column. The broken column represents the dead Osiris. He is the God who was murdered. He is a type of the Antichrist. The woman represents Isis weeping over the murder of Osiris. This same ritual was referred to as one of the abominations that God showed to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 8 where the women were weeping over Tammuz. The old man is regarded as time. Masonic authors teach that Father Time is a symbol for Saturn. Saturn, in turn, is a hidden symbol for Satan. Ambrosia is any food or drink of the gods that gives immortality and godhood to man. As we saw earlier, acacia is a thorn tree and is a symbol for the Antichrist. The ambrosia being poured into the ringlets of her hair, the ringlets of her hair represent a symbol for the double helix of DNA. So far in this presentation, we've seen several examples of the Antichrist being represented as being dead uh, and then being brought back to life by some ritual or at some point in time. One of the key symbols that is related to that is the symbol of the tomb or the casket. In the secret teachings of all ages, Manly P. Hall says that Hermes, which is a form of Hiram Abiff, was buried and a great treasure was placed in his tomb, a treasure of secret knowledge. This is related to the Masonic lost word that is buried and hidden in a tomb awaiting to be revealed. It was under the tombs that the supposed treasure of the Knights Templars was found or discovered in the movie National Treasure. This teaching is at the core of Dan Brown's book, The Lost Symbol, an ancient secret or treasure buried and accessed by a mystical port. Here is a quote from Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol. Legend holds that the verbum significatium is buried deep underground where it waits patiently for a pivotal moment in history, a moment when mankind can no longer survive without the truth, knowledge, and wisdom of the ages. At this dark crossroads, mankind will at last unearth the word and herald in a wondrous new age of enlightenment. In Albert Pike's book, Morals and Dogma, he teaches that Hiram Abiff is related to Osiris, the sun god, who was killed by his brother Typhon by placing him in a casket. His wife Isis, who represents the moon, retrieved the casket and concealed it. Albert Pike also says, In the mysteries of Phoenicia, established in honor of Tammuz or Adonis, also the sun, the spectacle of his death and resurrection was exhibited to the initiates. A figure was exhibited representing the corpse of a young man. Flowers were strewed upon his body. The women mourned for him. A tomb was erected for him. What is interesting to note about all this is that these images of Osiris or Tammuz or Adonis are almost always in the image of a young man. The image of a young man adorns the tarot card, the hanged man. Once again, we go to Manly P. Hall in his Secret Teachings of All Ages. He says, quote, Mithra was put to death by crucifixion and rose again on the 25th of March. In the Persian mysteries, the body of a young man, apparently dead, was exhibited, which was feigned to be restored to life. By his sufferings, he was believed to have worked their salvation 
And on this account, he was called their savior. His priest watched his tomb to the midnight of the vigil of the 25th of March with loud cries and in darkness. When all at once the light burst forth from all parts, the priest cried, Rejoice, O sacred initiated, your God is risen. His death, his pains and sufferings have worked your salvation. Manley Hall also tells us that the solar deity was usually personified as a beautiful youth with long golden hair to symbolize the rays of the sun. This golden sun god was slain by wicked ruffians. In the mysteries of the Phrygians, says Julius Firmicus, which are called those of the mother of the gods, every year a pine tree is cut down, and in the inside of the tree the image of a youth is tied in. In the mysteries of Isis, the trunk of a pine tree is cut. The middle of the trunk is nicely hollowed out. The idol of Osiris made from those hollowed pieces is buried. In the mysteries of Proserpine, a tree cut is put together into the effigy and the form of the virgin. And when it has been carried within the city, it is mourned forty nights. But the fortieth night, it is burned. Among other allegories borrowed by Christianity from pagan antiquity is the story of the beautiful blue-eyed sun god with his golden hair falling upon his shoulders, robed from head to foot in spotless white and carrying in his arms the Lamb of God, symbolic of the vernal equinox. This handsome youth is a composite of Apollo, Osiris, Orpheus, Mithras, and Bacchus, for he has certain characteristics in common with each of these pagan deities. Now, as we mentioned earlier, the candidate of Freemasonry who goes into the Blue Lodge must go through the first three degrees of Freemasonry in order to learn what he believes is the secret of Freemasons. Concerning these three degrees, Manly P. Hall writes, there were three degrees of the Druidic mysteries, but few successfully passed them all. The candidate was buried in a coffin as symbolic of the death of the sun god. Once again, we go back to the tarot cards. Manley Hall writes about them extensively and their true meanings. And we find that the tarot card called the Judgment features a male, a female, and a child emerging from the coffin at the sound of the trumpet. This is directly related to the trumpet judgments given to us in the book of Revelation chapters 8 and chapter 9. And it's in chapter 9, remember, that the fifth angel sounds or the fifth trumpet sounds and there is a key taken and opening up the bottomless pit and the king of the bottomless pit emerges whose name is Abaddon or Apollyon. Manley Hall writes about this trumpet blast and says, the blast of the trumpet represents the creative word by the intoning of which man is liberated from his terrestrial limitations. So we see here that Albert Pike, Manley Hall, and other Masonic writers are constantly and consistently referring to Osiris or Adonis or Bacchus or any of these other gods, these sun gods, as a young man. Now let's go back to the pages of the scripture to get more understanding concerning exactly who this sun god is or who this young man is and who he represents. 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 21, And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. Remember that Absalom was the son of David, who was the enemy of David, who was trying to take over the throne of King David. Also remember that Absalom had long flowing hair. He was hanged in a tree, and then he was buried in a pit. This concept that the Antichrist is equal to the lost word of Freemasonry is echoed by Manley Hall when he speaks of an ancient mystical hidden secret book called the Book of Thoth. The Book of Thoth was kept in a golden box in the inner sanctuary of the temple. There was but one key, and this was in the possession of the master of the mysteries, the highest initiate of the Hermetic Arcanum. He alone knew what was written in the secret book. The book of Thoth was lost to the ancient world with the decay of the mysteries, but its faithful initiates carried it sealed in the sacred casket into another land. This Masonic symbol of a casket containing the lost word of Freemasonry can be seen on this early Masonic tracing board. Surrounding this casket are three fives. This then is a reference to Isaiah chapter 14 and Lucifer's ultimate plan to be like the Most High. 
When taken together, these three fives would form the number 555. This just happens to be the exact number of times that the name Christ is mentioned in the King James Bible. In the late 16th century, artist Nicholas Poussin created a portrait called The Shepherds of Arcadia. This portrait was made famous by the authors of the Holy Blood, Holy Grail. It features three shepherds and a woman standing in front of a secret tomb. The shepherds are pointing to a caption engraved in the stone of the monument, which says, Et in Arcadia Ego, which translated into English says, I am also in Arcadia. It has been suggested that the phrase is actually an anagram for the Latin phrase, I tigo arcana dei, which translates, be gone, I keep God's secret. Arcadia is named for Arcus, the son of Zeus, and Callisto. A different rendering of the shepherds of Arcadia was done by Giovanni Barbieri in 1618. It features two shepherds beholding a human skull that has a deadly head wound in it. In the opening chapter of Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol, Brown reveals a Masonic ritual that includes the participant in a Masonic communion service drinking wine from a human skull. The meaning behind the symbols of the wine and the skull are revealed to us in Revelation chapter 17. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. And I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth hath committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns." And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. This skull is also featured in what's known as the Masonic Chamber of Reflection. A chamber of reflection is often used by Freemasons as a place to go and reflect and meditate upon their own death. Dan Brown speaks of there being a chamber of reflection in an underground room underneath the United States Capitol building. In the Masonic reflection room on the table, there is a skull and crossbones. We've already seen the meaning behind the skull and the crossbones. Remember, the crossbones are a symbol of an X chromosome. The skull represents the Antichrist added to the X chromosome where our DNA is stored. The most visible yet secretive part of the Masonic chamber of reflection is a word written upon the background. That word is vitriol. In alchemy, this represents another name for sulfuric acid, a dissolving agent. It is noted by Masonic authors that the word vitriol has seven letters. These seven letters are representative of the number seven, which represents the seven heads of the Antichrist, or the seven spirits of the Antichrist. It is revealed that the letters of the word vitriol stand for a Latin phrase, visita interiora terre, rectificando in venis occultum lapidum. This translates into English, visit the center of the earth, and by rectifying ye shall find the hidden stone. That hidden stone is the lapis exilum, the lost word of Freemasonry, the Antichrist. Now, let me tell you a little story about the obelisk. You've probably seen this image in a lot of places. There's one in the Vatican. Dan Brown reveals in the Da Vinci Code that there's one in a Roman Catholic cathedral called saint Sulpice, which is located in Paris, France. This obelisk happens to be 33 feet tall. Now, we're going to see the symbolic meaning of that number as we end this video. And of course, the most famous one is located in Washington, D.C. The story of the obelisk goes like this. Remember Osiris, the sun god? He's related to all of these other gods that we have seen that have been murdered. Osiris was murdered by his brother Typhon, and then his body was cut into 14 pieces. Now remember Isis, she represents the woman who is weeping over the broken column. Isis takes Osiris' body and gathers up all the fragments of his body and puts them back together so that he can live again. But she can only find 13 pieces to his body. 
The 14th piece, his phallus, is still covered. It's still hidden. It still remains a mystery, a mystery awaiting to be found. So therefore, the obelisk represents the concealment of the Mason's lost word or a symbol of the Antichrist. Now, I think as I look at the symbol of the obelisk, I think that not, it not only represents a phallus, it represents an uncircumcised phallus. Remember when David was fighting Goliath. Now, I want you to get this of who exactly Goliath was. Goliath was, according to the scriptures, the product of the sons of God mingling themselves with the daughter of men and producing the race of the giants. That's found in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis 6 reveals that this process took place before the flood and it took place after the flood. So here we have a Goliath who represents the Antichrist in the last days. We already saw the sixes that were all over, all over him earlier on in this video. And here is what David said concerning Goliath. David spake to the men and stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? He later says, Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear. Remember in Revelation chapter 13, those are both emblems of the Antichrist, the beast. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. Of course, it is interesting to note with all that we've seen so far in this video that in this country and maybe in other countries, an obelisk is often used as a marker over the tomb of a dead person. Now, it was noted earlier that the house of the Temple Lodge in Washington, D.C. contained 33 columns. The throne on the inside of the temple room where the worshipful master is seated is a 33-foot-high throne. This lodge is located at 1733, which makes it the 33rd house on the 17th block. The Masonic Cathedral in St. Louis also bears the number 33 in its address. Several years ago, House Resolution number 33 was passed, commending the influence of Freemasonry in America. The number 33 inside of a triangle adorns the image of the double eagle of Freemasonry. This is the image of the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Albert Pike reveals that the double-headed eagle with one head facing one direction and one head facing the other refers to the fusion of opposites contained in one body, male and female, the heaven with the earth, the human fused with the divine. In the lost symbol, Dan Brown, using information gathered from Manley Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages, references the name of God in the first chapter of Genesis. In fact, in the King James Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, the name of God is mentioned exactly 32 times. The 33rd time that God's name is mentioned is found in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So then, following this pattern in Masonic ideology, the number 32 represents the great arcanum or the great work of Freemasonry. The number 33 or the 33rd time God is mentioned in the King James Bible represents the finished work on the seventh day. This is a Masonic reference to the number 7, and a reference not just to the creation of mankind, but the recreation of mankind. Manly P. Hall says that the 33 degrees of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry is related to the 33 bones of the human spinal column. This is related to the Eastern mystic idea or concept called Kundalini. Kundalini teaches that at the base of everyone's spine is a coiled serpent. Through certain rituals and certain practices or in time, the serpent will uncoil itself, writhing itself around upward through the 33 bones of the human spinal column up into the human skull where the pineal gland is located, giving the human being enlightenment or the third eye of godhood. Concerning this, Manly Hall reveals the following. The exact science of human regeneration is the lost key of masonry. 
For when the spirit fire is lifted up through the 33 degrees or segments of the spinal column and enters into the domed chamber of the human skull, it finally passes into the pituitary body, which represents Isis, where it invokes Ra, the pineal gland, and demands the sacred name. Now let's go to the pages of the Bible, and we will clearly see that the number 33 is the quintessential number for the revealing of the beast in the last days. Remember, this was prophesied in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the man of sin would be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now remember, this Antichrist or this beast, the son of perdition, the man of sin, is opposing everything that is called God or that is worshipped. The beast stands in direct opposition to number one, God himself, and number two, the people of God. And so for a clear picture of this, let's go back to the book of Joshua, chapter 12. The Bible says, Now these are the kings of the land, which the children of Israel smote and possessed their land on the other side, Jordan, toward the rising of the sun, from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain on the east. Now, here's the interesting part. Moses was the one who was responsible for leading the children of Israel from Egypt to as far as the Jordan River. During that time, the two opposing kings, or the kings that opposed Israel's march into the Promised Land, were Sion and Og, who was the king of the giants. Moses and his army was responsible for killing those two kings. And then in Joshua chapter 12, we read on to see that after Moses has departed from the scene, Joshua then leading the children of Israel across the river Jordan into the promised land, we pick up in verse 9, we see the king of Jericho, the king of Ai, the king of Bethel, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, all the way down, verse 23, the king of Dor and the coast of Dor, the king of the nations of Gilgal won, the king of Tirzah won, and all the kings, 31. So in other words, the scripture is revealing to us that Moses killed two of these kings who stood in opposition to God. Joshua killed 31 of these kings who stood in opposition to God. Their total number, 33. It was 33 kings who stood in opposition to God and his people. This then was symbolized by Christ. Remember, Christ made a show of the enemies of God openly while he was on the cross. How old was Christ when he died? 33 years old. In 1 Kings chapter 20, we find another representation of kings who are opposing the armies of God, the Israelites. In 1 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, the Bible says, And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his hosts together, and there were thirty and two kings with him, and horses and chariots, and he went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, with his thirty-two kings, equals thirty-three kings total, who are in opposition and besieging the children of God, and thus God himself. Remember what we learned earlier. The number 32 represents the elevated man. Remember the image of the Sephiroth. The Sephiroth was 10 circles representing the 10 kings of the kingdom that Daniel described in Daniel chapter 2, the kingdom that shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. These 10 circles or 10 kings in the Sephiroth mingle themselves with 22 paths representing the 22 amino acids of human DNA that forms exactly who we are as human beings. So the imagery here given to us in 1 Kings chapter 20 is that the 32 kings represent the elevated man or the God man, those human beings who have been elevated to the status of Godhood by having their seed mingled with Daniel's fourth kingdom in Daniel chapter 2. Their king, Ben-Hadad, being added to this number represents the number 33. It is the number for the Antichrist in his people who stand in direct opposition to God, who gather themselves together in the valley of Megiddo or Armageddon to face off with Jesus and those who have been resurrected in the last days to fight with him. 
But of course, you and I both know that the Antichrist and all of the enemies of God were already defeated at the cross of Jesus Christ when Jesus was 33 years old. Now, remember this verse we've looked at several times throughout this video. Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now, one of the interesting things that I see in the King James Bible is that this exact phrase, the beast, is used in exactly 46 verses of the King James Bible. 46, remember, is the exact number of chromosomes represented by the two columns of Jachin and Boaz. The 33rd occurrence of the phrase, the beast, is mentioned in Revelation chapter 13, verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell save he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And a more interesting note is that when we confine our search of the phrase, the beast, to the New Testament of the King James Bible, we find that it is recorded for us exactly 33 times. The very first occurrence of the phrase, the beast, in the New Testament of the Bible is found in Acts chapter 28, verse 5. This is a story concerning Paul. The Bible says, and he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. This is a beautiful image of exactly what was prophesied by Daniel in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, verse 11. And I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. I hope you've been enlightened to some extent as to what the secrets of Freemasonry are and a lot of their symbols and what they really represent. If you've read Dan Brown's The Lost Symbol, then you realize what the lost symbol is referred to by Brown in this novel. Dan Brown tells you that the lost symbol is the Bible. Now, one of the things that really strikes me about Dan Brown's writing and his belief systems, and he based a lot of his research and his beliefs upon what Manly Hall wrote in The Secret Teachings of All Ages, uh, which is kind of why I use that heavily in this presentation. But Dan Brown has the belief, and he's admitted the belief, and this belief comes out in the lost symbol, that he believes in the Bible, but he doesn't believe that the Bible should be taken literally. And in fact, he says that in the law symbol, he says that there are people, fundamentalist Christians like myself, who take the Bible way too seriously. It was never intended to be taken literally, but allegorically and only as a symbol. Dan Brown could, be, could not be any farther from the truth as far as I'm concerned. The Bible is always and has always been intended to be understood in its literal way. God doesn't have a problem speaking. God does speak in symbols, but he always explains those symbols to us in the pages of the Bible itself. The Bible is it's always its own best dictionary. The Bible is intended to represent the Word of God. It's also intended to represent the plan of God for, for humanity. Humanity is, a, is in a fallen state right now because of our own wickedness and our own sin. The Bible then reveals the plan of God's salvation. It's not in Osiris. It's not in Bacchus. It's not in Tammuz. It's not in Adonis. It's not in any of these false gods that have appeared to have been murdered and resurrected for the benefit of mankind. All of these are images of a false Christ, not the real Christ. The real Christ is revealed to us in the scriptures as the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He came because he was obedient to his Father. He came to reconcile man to God. Man is in a fallen state. Man is sinful. Christ died on the cross to redeem man from his fallen state so that man could live forever. My recommendation to you is that you read the Bible, you study the Bible, you meditate on the Bible, and you believe the Bible so that you will know that the promise of eternal life is real and it's offered to you freely by God through His Son, Jesus Christ. This is Pastor Mike, and I hope you've enjoyed this video presentation. May the Lord bless you. Bye-bye.